everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and today we are going to investigate using asymmetric acid to cuddle dye some yarn and then see if we see anything obvious. Now, this is part one of what will probably be a few videos exploring this technique. Uh, but I want to start similarly to how I started the asymmetric heat and go for an exaggerated kettle dye, but in my steam pan. So that way, yes, the acid would be able to move freely once we add it, but the dye can also move through the pan a little bit as well. So we can see if we end up with more color in one spot than another based on where we apply our acid. So that is the plan today. Before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to our lab partner today, Raylene. Raylene, thank you so much for being my lab partner and I really hope you're gonna love the yarn that we dye. Speaking of yarn, today we're gonna dye 200 or 300 grams, I haven't decided, uh, but we're gonna be dyeing some Knit Picks Felici fingering weight yarn. Like Stroll that I use all the time, Felici is 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon, but it's a little bit denser, um, it has a little bit more twist, it's a little bit rounder, and it is, the main difference between this and Stroll is they're made at different mills, so therefore the twist and everything is a little different. Uh, but uh, one reason why I picked this is that the physical skeins are actually shorter. Um, so when we look at the skein here in the pan, it can be more straight versus scrunched. Um, and so therefore I think that yeah, I think that that's something that will help uh, for this experiment. Now, it's very possible, like the first heat one, we're not going to see a lot, and I'm probably going to want to go to something that is more low immersion, uh, add acid so it's just in one spot and compare over the area that had acid versus the areas that didn't. That's something that I am assuming I will be filming after this, but given that a lot of times when you're kettle dyeing yarn, sometimes you just add a little bit more acid in but don't really stir things up. And so that is the scenario that I'm trying to exaggerate here today. I pre-soaked 300 grams of the yarn in some plain tap water overnight. Again, I am not yet sure if we are gonna use all 300 grams or if we want to use less. But one other thing I do wanna point out, my tap water does run slightly acidic. So when I have just plain tap water, it's not no acid. Uh, so another variation that depending on the results we might explore in the future is to start with distilled water that should be neutral with no acid in it at all. But anyway, let's go and get our dye ready. I thought it would be fun to use Dharma Acid Dye in the sea spray today. This color is a gorgeous marine blue type color and it does break, even though I haven't quite been able to replicate some breaking that I've seen and drawn question marks around with the dye in solution. So who knows, maybe we'll see something today um, or else we might just get a beautiful tonal in this color, which would also be really wonderful. I suited up with my respirator mask, safety glasses, and gloves to measure out three grams of the sea spray acid dye. My respirator mask is a P100 filtered half mask, and I do link to both the one I specifically use, and I also have a blog post on other respirator masks recommended by dyers uh, that I'll link to down in the video description. Once I had the dye measured out, I dissolved it in an unspecific volume of water. Since what matters overall is the total amount of dye that we're adding to yarn, I'm not concerned with the volume that I have that I mix the dye in. I just want to make sure it is well dissolved. And since I still am not sure if I want 200 grams of yarn in the pan or 300 grams of yarn in the pan, again the Either way, I'm comfortable either having a 1% depth of shade with, with one gram of dye per 100 grams of yarn, or a 1.5% depth of shade, which would be one and a half grams of dye per 100 grams of yarn. So either way, I plan to use up all of this dye. Here in my 
four inch deep catering steam pan. I've added 16 cups of water. And now I'm gonna come in and add our dye. So that way we can hopefully, hopefully get something that is very even in color. But one thing to note, so there does appear to be a pigment in sea spray that is slower to dissolve than others. So what I would like to do as we stir this up is that I would like, huh. So what I would like to do is let this sit uh, for about 10 minutes and then I'm gonna come and stir it again. I don't see any particles in it, but sometimes just a little bit of time uh, might help. So anyway, I'll come back in 10 minutes. The heat is still off. Normally a waiting step like this is not something I would bother with, but I have noticed with sea spray that when I think a cup is empty and I go and I soak it, I then see, oh, there was one particle that just started to dissolve at that very end. So I hoped that this time would mean that we're well dissolved. Now I'm gonna come in with our yarn and I'm actually gonna add the end in first that will I'm not gonna add the acid to uh, and then bring it down this way. So again, we're going for something kettle dyed. Uh, and so I wanted there to be a lot of liquid um, because I want that dye to be able to move through. Now I have not yet added any acid at all. Um, and I don't plan to until we've started to heat things up. Now, I know from my past experiment that the asymmetric heat doesn't make a huge difference, but maybe it did. <laughs> so as I turn on the heat, I'm not expecting the dye to start clearing. Uh, this is sort of where we are at the moment. I am expecting that we might have some color bind to the yarn already since there is no acid in here. But I think that if I were adding this to the pot with acid already in here, we would start seeing it strike um, because that's typically what I see. So we will be, we're gonna add, we're gonna wait for things to heat up and I'm gonna give it a reasonable amount of time to heat up so that way, and I guess we'll stir. We'll stir things one more time before we add acid to try to distribute that heat as evenly as we can. So anyway, I'll wait 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll come back. For those of you that don't know, I do have a PhD in biochemistry and molecular pharmacology. And I actually started Chemnitz as a hobby back when I was working on my degree. Uh, so sometimes when I'm setting up a dyeing experiment, and there are so many variables at play that I can't control for everything. Uh, that <laughs> makes me, oh, a little frustrated because I want to control as many variables as possible to get, you know, to be able to have a true comparison and not throw the caveat of, okay, there are all these other elements that could have come into play. But really there are all these elements that could come into play. And so this could end up as a failed experiment. And I also wanna clarify that in, when I was trying the asymmetric heat, in part two, I called it a fail. It wasn't a fail because of the yarn, it was a fail because of the experiment. And so I didn't set it up in a way that I could make any conclusions. So the fail was just error in the setup, not in the yarn, if that makes sense. I know no matter what, I'm gonna love the yarn that we get here. If this is a fail, it's gonna be because we didn't, if we don't see anything noticeable, it's a result of not being able to control the variables more than it's a result of not liking the yarn. So I hope that that makes some sense. So it's good we did this because I haven't added any acid. I suppose there's a chance that there could have been, maybe I didn't clean the pan and there could be some acid on the pan, 
but the color has all absorbed. Um, on to our yarn. Making this officially a quote fail. <laughs> this yarn is still absolutely beautiful, but the fact that my tap water is acidic enough that these colors struck before I even added acid means that this was not a good setup to investigate this uh, and means that oh goodness it means that I definitely should uh, look into using some distilled water um, something that is already starting at a neutral pH so this won't happen I brought over my litmus paper because I am curious about the pH of our dye bath right now and I mean I would say that the pH that I see is I mean you're not very close it's probably around between a 6 and a 7 consistent with what my tap water is this is our dye bath right here which I would say maybe it's probably around a pH of 6 this is my tap water. Um, I just went over to the faucet, stuck it in, and so that shows that uh, they're both, I would say, equivalent. Granted, this is extremely qualitative, um, but it's certainly not, you know, a neutral pH. This piece I stuck in just straight vinegar, which has a pH of around, I would say around three. Um, maybe yeah, probably probably at about a three. Now a pH scale is logarithmic, so the difference between a six and a three is a lot. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's not oh my tap water is not always enough for dye to strike. But I'm glad that I waited because it didn't take very long for all that dye to absorb, and so. It's not that asymmetric acid doesn't make a difference. I mean, I haven't added acid, so it wasn't asymmetric. But if I had done that right away, if I had added the acid right away, uh, then maybe we saw it sh strike everywhere. We're like, okay, maybe then I would think, okay, the acid, uh, we could reach an equilibrium really quickly, or maybe the acid didn't make a huge difference at being asymmetric. But since we know that the dye really absorbed with some heat and no acid, uh, no additional acid, I suppose, because it is acidic, knowing that, uh, therefore, you know, we wouldn't have been able to make a conclusion that I wanted to make. Um, now, we didn't try leaving this without heating it to see if the colors would have struck under those circumstances. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot to think about and a lot to adapt to. Well, so far this is just an example of why controls are important <laughs> to your process because without a control, uh, we wouldn't know <laughs> how things were going. Uh, and it would be hard, and we might make conclusions, without control, we might make conclusions that aren't accurate because, oh my gosh, this head cleared completely. I did just add acid and I'm stirring. I'm gonna leave this yarn in here to cool completely. Uh, I think it's a beautiful tonal yarn, but asymmetric acid wasn't at play. And even my suggestion that, okay, maybe there was some residual acid on something, I suppose locally that could have been the case, but we checked the pH and it wasn't noticeably more acidic than my tap water. So I guess this color strikes really fast is what we've learned. Which I suppose means I should add that it's a reason why using a color that is a known, using a color that I haven't played with as much is maybe not the best choice for an experiment because some colors strike really fast. Like Derma Frozen, I know strikes really fast because I've used it a lot. Whereas I know some other colors don't strike nearly as quickly. So what I'm gonna do is turn off the heat 
let this cool in the pan slowly so that way it does have time with that heat and actual acid to make sure things are well set. And we're gonna reset with that third skein of Felici to try something else. In a new steam pan, I'm coming in with one skein of Felici and let's add, I'm gonna add a bit of the pre-soak. I'm not measuring, which maybe is uh, not a mistake, uh, but I want enough water in here so that way things aren't going to be able to easily move around. I think I want a tiny bit more. I don't want as much liquid as we had that first time, but I do want there to be an ability for some things to move. And one thing I'm not liking right now is how, there we go. The ends were feeling a lot uh, more bunched than the middle, so I moved the areas with the ties towards that middle so I could spread the yarn out more uh, near our edges. Now I'm gonna heat things up. And we are gonna wait until this gets nice and hot, which should not take very long. Okay, things are getting nice and hot and I'm going to move the yarn so we know that our heat is well distributed or at least the best that we can. Just touching it and making sure that things are warm throughout. Now I am going to add some acid just on this end closest to me and I just added two tablespoons. And so, and I'm, I am going to just press in this area to attempt to distribute it. And I'm coming in with my 1% stock solution of radioactive and adding a line. I'll add one in the middle as well. Um, so everything is hot. I'm going to reduce the heat. But I have acid down here and not down here. And so now we're gonna wait and see what we can see because there is a chance that the acid can travel down and actually we can test that as well, maybe. It does depend, we might not see a huge difference. So down here, uh, that is orange. Okay, I would say it's really, really close. Uh, but it is slightly more acidic down here than down there. Slightly. Uh, so I do think we do have some asymmetric acid in here. And that's about it. I mean, certainly we know acid makes a difference. We've tried dyeing things pre-soaked in acid and not pre-soaked in acid and then dip dyeing them after. It does make a difference on the rate that things strike. Um, I was just hoping that we might see something that feels more different. Oh, I know what we can do now. It's been about a minute and I would say, ooh, there is not currently a huge difference between what we see in the two areas. I am gonna now come and press down here. So it does look like that blue in there is striking really quickly and I'm not seeing a lot of dye that can be moved around. And over here, um, there was a little bit there, but the same, the same thing. Now, the lines that I drew, aha, here there is more acid. The line of blue does look sharper here than it does down there. Uh, but again, this is uh, a, little, a little hard to say. So what I'm gonna do now is I am going to add more acid right there on an area. Um, and what we're gonna do is down here where I did not add acid, we're gonna add a line there we're gonna add a line here, approximately where I added that acid, and I am going to press right away. So that green line struck really, really quickly. And pressing it down, 
we see spread. And we see that down here as well. Maybe uh, a little patchier here, but I'm not seeing a huge, huge difference right off the bat. Similar to with the asymmetric heat, I didn't necessarily see a huge, huge difference. But I am gonna bring over a little more litmus paper and test right here versus down there. Okay, so my gloves are purple, which is not gonna make this easy to see side by side, so I'm gonna go to the counter. All right, so our sample that was where I added the acid is more orange versus the sample where I had not added acid yet. It's again slight, it is subtle, it is not dramatic. Um, and so the results, I'm not sure I saw much of anything, which is interesting to me. So let's chat and I'm gonna go ahead and dye this yarn um, using a lot more of the radioactive. I started just having fun with it and randomly adding the radioactive onto the skein of yarn all over the place in all different ways. From my observations overall, having acid present makes a bigger difference on the rate that the colors are striking when compared to heat. Both of them make a difference, but I have hypothesized from the times when I've added uh, dye or yarn to a cool dye bath with acid in it and dye and watching that yarn soak it up that quickly, uh, it does make a difference. Uh, so things that I think I can control um, and try this again in the future. I should probably try this with a non-superwash yarn. So that way it slows down the rates overall, which maybe we would see more of a difference in how things strike and spread, especially uh, when it came to the first thing we tried when things struck just immediately. So that is one thing that I should try. Another thing, as I mentioned, is trying to start with water that has a pH of seven and seeing if that makes a difference. Uh, and so those are two main things that I think I want to control for. But I am glad that in this video, I quickly looked at two different techniques. But given that we also saw that colors are striking to my yarn with uh, no additional acid, eh, so I don't know. I don't know how many conclusions we can really make here. I don't think this negates things that we saw um, with our asymmetric heat. And certainly from when I was looking at the yarn with the radioactive, the stripes in the area that did not have acid yet looks a little bit more blue. I do think that the yellow from the radioactive spread further there than it did in the area with acid because I think some of that yellow was starting to strike faster. So there are a lot of things to consider moving forward. I think Oh, another thing that I could try would be to try play with asymmetric acid and no heat yet um, and to do that cool and to see if that makes a huge difference in the way colors strike, uh, especially since we know that uh, these colors struck really, really quickly with no additional acid. So that is another thing that we can explore. But ultimately, I think that asymmetric heat and acid can absolutely make a difference. Uh, and so maybe my attempts to exaggerate things aren't the best. And I could versus trying something in one pan. People have suggested that I set up two pots and compare things there. The reason why I'm trying to do things within one pan is because is it you know, does it make a huge difference if you're going for, say, a semi-solid, uh, what things might you want to shift? Ultimately, though, I think that the biggest factor is how do you apply the dye to the yarn? Um, we know heat and acid speed up that rate of absorption. So if you want more even color, you want to have cool, no acid, and stir things around a lot so that way the fibers can access as much of the dye and have as large of a volume of water as possible. So there's all these variables and little tweaks in here, but should you worry necessarily if you add a tablespoon of acid to one end and not the other end really quickly and you don't stir really quickly, that it'll make an, an extreme difference? 
it doesn't look like it would be an extreme difference, but there is a difference. Um, oh, another thing that we could do to explore is to dip um, a skein into some acidic water and hand paint on the countertop and see how that might make a difference there. There's tons of little things that we can do. And so if any of these interest you, please let me know down in the comments below. And I will go ahead and order some distilled water. Uh, yeah, so that way we can try that for a project. But anyway, Raylene, I hope that uh, you're enjoying my conversation about controls <laughs> and how important these are when we make conclusions. And so, yeah, uh, it looks like, I mean, I'm still surprised that the color struck that quickly with heat and no additional acid. But again, I, it depends. All of these things, not only do they depend on heat and acid, but also the yarn base is important. Uh, the, not just the dye type, but the actual dye color is important. So some of these variables may make a bigger difference in different setups than others. And so that's also something to be aware of. But I look forward to doing at least one more video dedicated to, um, you know, in one pot having asymmetric acid. I will try this at least one more time. Uh, and yeah, using some of the things I discussed here. But anyway, uh, I am now going to wait for everything to cool and then we will go wash all of our yarn. Well, Raylene, I thought I was going to be making you a beautiful tonal, and I mean, it is a beautiful tonal. It's slightly semi-solid. We'll see how it is when it's dry, um, but <laughs> it's not quite what I expected, oh, which is really, really funny. So I'm washing all the yarn together. All of the uh, dye dust did clear, although maybe now that I look and I see them side by side on the stove, there might be like a hint of yellow in the radioactive pan. I'm not super concerned though. Uh, but anyway, I am going to add some dish soap just by rinsing off the soap on the outside of my dish soap bottle. <laughs> oh my goodness, okay. Um, and fingers crossed we see no bleeding. Okay, let's see. Wahoo, I am not seeing any color coming out of our yarn whatsoever, which is amazing. So I am going to finish rinsing the soap out of this yarn, then I will put it through my spin dryer and hang all the yarn up to dry so we can come back and have some conclusions. Well, Raylene, I was not quite able to do the asymmetric acid experiment that I intended, but I do hope to get some supplies so that way I can try this experiment starting with a more neutral pH uh, to then see and exaggerate the asymmetric acid. So I will be revisiting this at some point in the future. With this radioactive skein over on the left, I did try to quickly look and see if I saw any huge differences from asymmetric acid. And honestly, I'm a bit surprised that I didn't see something more obvious or conclusive. But I think that ultimately, what it comes down to is that there are many variables that influence the rates that dyes bind to yarn. And heat and acid are both absolutely factor, factors. And they're factors that are hard to isolate. Now granted, I would be able to, for example, set up a bunch of single, I guess, situations where I have a hotter pot and a colder pot and try to look at the rates. And there are ways that I could isolate some of these variables more. But the reason why I'm interested in the asymmetric heat or asymmetric acid is to understand does not shaking the pan and therefore distributing the heat through make a big difference or maybe just a little difference? And so, or does the fact that, you know, I added acid to the top of the pot but didn't stir it, could that make a big difference? 
Uh, and so those questions uh, and, and those variables that aren't controlled that sometimes I might speculate and wonder if that could have influenced the results that I'm seeing in the pan are ultimately still questions. There's a lot of variables at play. And while I plan to explore and investigate further to see if I can get something a little more conclusive, the lack of a result doesn't is it conclusive either. Because there's so many things that I can't control for. Uh, so there is that. But ultimately, we do know that in if I were to have two different jars um, or two different pots, one with acid and heat and one without acid and heat, the one with acid and heat would absorb that dye faster. That we know. Uh, what I don't know is how quickly the heat traveling in a pan or the acid diffusing through a solution influences the final colors that we see. Looking closer at the sea spray yarn, there is breaking in here. Right here, it's very subtle. It's a little more green, and there's some areas that are a little more blue. I think it's really, really hard to see, like maybe right there, you can see a spot that's a little more green. I'm not sure if it's even coming across on camera, but I do feel that there are some huge differences versus just depths of shade. Another thing I want to quickly point out is something with regards to depth of shade. I dyed this 200 grams of yarn with three grams of the sea spray acid dye, which gives these two skeins a one and a half percent depth of shade. This skein right here was dyed with extreme blue at a depth of shade at 0.125%. So there was only 0.125 grams of dye on this blue skein. And yet on each of these, we had one and a half grams of dye, 10 times as much dye. And the colors don't look significantly more saturated when there is 10 times as much dye there. What accounts for this? Well, when you're dealing with pre-mixed dyes, they are pre-mixed. Sea spray is designed as a more pastel shade versus something really more saturated. And extreme blue, which I used here, is mixed to be an intense blue. So therefore, to get a pastel of it, you need to use a tiny amount of dye. And brands do this for paler shades, so that way you can have an easier time consistently mixing the amount of dye you need. Now, <laughs> I guess it's funny for me to be talking about this with sea spray because uh, dyers constantly are like, it is more green today, it is more blue today. And so there is that sort of hand waving <laughs> around sea spray. But in terms of the actual depth of color, this is another example of how the depth of shade for a color is really referenced into one color to itself, not in reference to the how pigmented the color looks to your eyes. And so this was something that really struck me when I was looking at this because let me, let me just show you. So this blue, I said, was a 0.125% depth of shade. Here is our 2% depth of shade. Now, in theory, uh, the sea spray should be a little closer to that if you were expecting the depth of shade to refer to how saturated something is. And so this is just another reason why when doing something like speckling or laying colors, with some colors you might be feeling like, Wow, I am using a ton of dye here. And that's because there's probably more filler in it. And so I think that that's something that I was seeing with sea spray in the past. So this is a big digression, but I really wanted to point that out. I am Rebecca from Cheminitz, and I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Yes, the experiment did not work the way that I thought it might. Uh, there were variables that existed that actually showed us the importance of having controls. Because, you know, if, if I had set this up 
Um, maybe if I'd set it up cold with acid, maybe we would have started to see something. But starting with something that is more of a neutral pH with the same setup, even if I already heat things up, uh, that should be able to tell us some things moving forward. But man, <laughs> my tap water is enough to do a lot of stuff which honestly is something we've observed before. So that's not so surprising. Raylene, thank you so much for being my lab partner today. Uh, I really hope that you both enjoyed this video with a lot of thoughts and conversations about controls. <laughs> and I really hope that you're gonna love your yarn. If you as a viewer wanna learn more about how you can become a lab partner and get shout outs and yarn dyed, in an episode of Dye Pot Weekly, where I take your yarn and color preferences into account, go and check out the listings in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop. It's been a while since I've dyed the Knit Picks Felici base, and it's a gorgeous yarn. There's a lot that I really like about it. I don't actually like that the skeins are shorter. It worked for what I wanted today because of the pans, but I prefer slightly longer skeins for twisting them, but that is just my uh, personal preference there. Uh, I love, for all other reasons, I absolutely love Felici. Um, the, the size of the skein is a really silly reason to dislike a yarn. Uh, so you don't really need to account for that, um, but uh, I'm really excited to die with it again, and I have more in my stash that I'm excited to play with. Huh. I wonder also now that I'm thinking about it, if could Felicia absorb dye a little faster than Stroll? It wouldn't make a ton of sense uh, because the yarn has the same fiber content, but they are produced from different mills and the merino is sourced from different places. So there could be some differences. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not planning to do like a pure side by side. I have dyed them in the same pot at the same time before. Um, but anyway, the thoughts that pop into my head as I am filming conclusions. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching everyone.